There are similarities between the Joshua narrative and the Ugaritic narrative of Keret. In the first story, God tells Joshua to march for seven days. In the second story, El tells Keret to march for seven days. God tells Joshua to besiege Jericho for another seven days, and El tells Keret to besiege Udom for seven days. God tells Joshua not to take silver or gold or anything else from Jericho, and El tells Keret to refuse offers of silver and gold from the king of Udom. Joshua performs religious ceremonies to Yahweh for three days before besieging Jericho, and Keret performs religious ceremonies to Asherah for three days before besieging Udom. Joshua and his army march around the city in complete silence for six days, and Keret and his army march around the city in complete silence also for six days. In the first story, after six days of silence, Joshua's army cries out and the city walls crash to the ground. In the second story, after six days of silence, the animals begin to make so much noise that the king of Udom can no longer stand it. In the first story, a woman from Jericho, Rahab, the prostitute, joins the side of the besieging army. And in the second story, a woman from Udom, Huri, the princess, joins the side of the besieging army. In the first story, Achan breaks his vow to Yahweh by stealing the gold devoted to him and is punished. And in the second story, Karet breaks his vow to Asherah by neglecting to devote gold to her and is punished. Now, the Ugaritic manuscripts are older than the Joshua narrative. They originated in a time period before the time of Israel. So, does this mean that the writer of Joshua just stole this story and changed some things up before putting it in his book? That is certainly one possibility, but why would someone do this? It was actually fairly common for the Israelites to borrow various narrative traditions from their neighbors and update them to fit the theology of their own god, Yahweh. There was no such thing as plagiarism back then. Plagiarism is a taboo in our culture, but not in all cultures at all times. And this was a really effective way of communicating the differences between Israel's God and the gods of other nations. Everyone already knew the stories of the gods and heroes of other nations, so when the Hebrew writer takes those stories and interweaves them with stories about the character of the Hebrew God and the true history of his people, he is really making some deep theological statements in a very poignant way to the people at the time. So, does this mean that the events of Joshua never happened? Not necessarily. We need to keep in mind that the Bible is, first of all, a book of theology, and secondly, a book of history. If history gets in the way of making a really awesome theological story, then history can be changed, because the theological message is the priority. The book of Judges actually has a very different take on the conquest of the land than the book of Joshua does, saying that many of the cities that were on the list of conquered cities in Joshua weren't actually conquered. This could also possibly explain why little to no detail is given on the battles that would have taken place to conquer them in Joshua. At first, Joshua seems to paint a picture of a quick conquest of the land. However, if you keep reading, there are some passages in Joshua that actually seem to agree more with Judges when they say that it really took quite a long time to conquer much of the land. The list of conquered cities in the book of Joshua is very similar to the list of unconquered cities that comes later in the book of Judges. For example, Joshua conquers Tanakh, but Judges says that Tanakh remained unconquered. The same is true with Megiddo. Gezer is another city which Joshua says was conquered and Judges says wasn't. However, in Joshua 16.10, even Joshua says that Gezer remained unconquered. We see the same story with Debir and Hatsor and Jerusalem, which according to 2 Samuel was conquered by David, as well as the city of Dor. Elsewhere in the Bible also seems to lean more towards the Book of Judges version of the entering of the Israelites into Canaan. Psalm 106 says, They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord had commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and adopted their customs. They worshipped their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to false gods. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and their land was desecrated by their blood. They defiled themselves by what they did. By their deeds, they prostituted themselves. So, why does there seem to be so many contradictions? Well, because the Bible isn't just a book. It's a bunch of books written by a bunch of people who didn't always agree with each other on every single detail. We need to also remember that while the same person is responsible for the final versions of both Joshua and Judges, that person was relying on stories from very different groups of people. The Joshua stories seem to have originated out of the northern tribes, and they seek to portray northern tribal leaders like Joshua in a very positive light, whereas the Judges stories seem to have originated out of the southern tribe of Judah, and they seek to portray Judaic leaders like Caleb in a positive light, while at the same time implying that the northern tribes were mostly miserable failures when it came to obeying God. 
Joshua should not be read on its own, but in the context of the surrounding books. Judges paints a very different picture of Israel's entry into Canaan, and the two versions of history in Joshua and Judges exist to balance each other out. Joshua represents Israel's complete success, and Judges represents Israel's complete failure. The truth emerges when the two histories are told together.